I'm Nate Avery, I'm an outbound product manager at Google, and today we'll, we'll go over some practices for DevOps velocity and security on Google Cloud. Uh, we're gonna set the stage up front, we're gonna do some welcome and intros, we'll talk DevOps culture, Dora, use of cloud, and then we'll have our guests tell us about their proven results and a perspective from the ground. Uh, if this is not what you thought this session would be, I totally understand and you're free to pick another session. <laughs> um, okay, so this is us. Um, we know that most teams are gonna wanna improve velocity, right? That's the rate at which changes are made and put into production. And this group of practitioners here we all come from a variety of places. There are some of us uh, at Google uh, in product management. Uh, we have software engineers. And then we have folks from industry who've got great experience doing this and explaining it and working with it on a day-to-day -day basis. The goal of all of this is to share with you real life practices that should work. We don't want you to believe it just because we say it, but because it can work elsewhere. Okay, so we'll get, to get things started by talking about Dora. Uh, that's where most of the tips are gonna come from. DevOps research and assessment is what Dora stands for, and it was started in 2015. Google Cloud purchased it in 2018. Now, even though we bought it, um, we continue to, to invest in it and expand it. Uh, the goal is to, increase capacity to help our customers understand uh, just how they can apply the research that's being done. Uh, we wanna make it real and actionable. In terms of the number of folks who work on this, uh, there are 33,000 professionals worldwide who've contributed data to this. Uh, and we have lots of bright people and lots of bright math and all kinds of stuff going into this to help peel back the onion and help us understand what's actually happening and what are the trends and what are some of the things that you can do to improve your, in, your environment. Okay, so uh, unless you're like brand new to IT, you've probably seen this before, DevOps, isn't just about tech, it's about tech and culture. And it feels a bit of a cliche to say it, <laughs> but we kind of have to because we actually have stats to prove it. We look to the research to help us understand the DevOps world and to provide us with some insights. Our most recent report is said that there was a clear drop in the high and the elite groups and What's interesting about that is that it suggests that this year's respondents were either just starting their DevOps culture or had a very poor DevOps culture. So again, we're starting to see that you can't just ignore it. And here's another chart here. No surprise to anyone that the dream team there, they're performance oriented, they have above average uh, team stability, above average support, above average flexibility. I mean, that's kind of what it takes. Um, so we'll take a look at some of the metrics. The report breaks down aspects of, of software delivery into two types, speed and stability. Now, everybody wants to make things faster. I mean, that's kind of a universal deal. But organizations will often say that they can have either speed or stability. Right? They think it's like a trade-off. And I think we've all been in places where someone said, you can have it fast or you can have it right. You know, which one do you want? But what's interesting is that our data tells us that you don't have to sacrifice these at all. That they're both actually uh, complementary in their outcomes of a good environment. So there's a lot in it to buy in. If you buy into it properly, you will benefit. There are four main metrics in Dora to be aware of. Lead time for change. That's, you know, how long, uh, how long does it take for a commit to get into production? Deployment frequency, 
which is how often you release software. Change failure rate, what percentage of releases degrade production? And then mean time to, re to restore service, which is how quickly can you recover if there is a problem? And I gotta mention something here. Do not try to game these metrics. Um, it's very tempting. A lot of us want to. <laughs> a lot of people are into like, you know, trying to hit targets. But that's not really what we're doing here. Um, the goal of this is to measure where your environment is, you make a change, you measure it again, and you compare. Hopefully, you're better off than you were. But you might not be. Things happen. So what do you do? You just do it again. You make, make a change, measure it, compare it, see if you're better off. The idea here is that we're gonna treat our people and our teams and our procedures the same way we, we, we would treat software, which is an iterative approach. And again, some, the numbers are here to just kind of solidify this, right? Um, we want you to walk away knowing that there actually was some effort and that there's a reason why you should stick into this. 114 times more frequent uh, code deployments, three times lower change failure rates. Uh, what is that, 23.7 times faster time to, de to deploy? I mean, that's kind of nice. Oh, sorry, deploy was 26.5, even better. <laughs> so there's one other aspect here I gotta talk about, and that's use of the cloud. Yeah, I know, I'm a cloud guy. We're at a cloud conference. Um, I probably being paid somewhat to talk about cloud. Um, but again, when we talk about cloud in relation to Dora, it actually works out pretty good because we see that, for, that those who are on cloud are 14% more likely to succeed in their organization performance goals. So again, we're looking at the things that work and that really kind of push the envelope for customers. So these guys here, they're just a small sample of some of the partners we work with. Definitely not an exhaustive list. Uh, and now I'm going to hand things over to Christy for a demo. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Christy Warwick. I'm a software engineer at Google where I co-created an open source CI CD framework called Tekton. I am so passionate about continuous delivery that I actually wrote a book about it. It took three years, I don't recommend it. But that's not what I'm here to talk to you about today. Today I want to show you how you can use GCP to take what Nate was saying and actually put it into practice. So the project that I'm going to use is one that's in this GitHub repo here, and it's a really simple project that just shows population statistics for countries. Because the truth is that ideally, we would bake all this stuff in from the start, but the reality is that it's rare that we get to work on greenfield projects. We're usually working on something that already exists. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to take this project that already exists, and we're going to improve the stability, the speed, and the security. So let's take a look at this project. So the way that this project works is that it's built into a Docker image that's deployed to GKE, and we manage those deployments using Cloud Deploy, which sounds pretty good from the start, but there are some problems. So the team that's working on this finds that they get outages almost every time that they deploy. As a result, this has made them really nervous to do deployments. So if we look from a Dora perspective, it's not looking great. The deployment frequency is low because people are afraid to make changes. Because the deployment frequency is low, the lead time for changes is high, and then the change failure rate is also really high. The one thing we have going for us is that cloud deploy makes rollbacks pretty easy, so at least the time to restore is pretty fast. So let's figure out how we can improve this. 
We'll take a quick look at a bug that managed to make it into production. So this is a bug that made it to production and caused an outage with the entire service. One of the things that went wrong here is that the change went out to all the users at once and took everybody down. So one way that we can improve that, since we're already using Cloud Deploy, is that we can use a Canary deployment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my Cloud Deploy configuration and I'm going to add a Canary deployment strategy. So what this will do is when I make a change, instead of going out to all the users, a Canary deployment will be created and it'll only hit about 5% of users and then a verification will happen. So that way we'll find out if anything's wrong. At the same time, I'm going to use another feature of Cloud Deploy and I'm going to add some regionalization. So previously, I already created several more Kubernetes clusters. We have the US cluster that I was already showing you, and then we have one in Europe and one in Asia as well. So I'm going to use a multi-target rollout so that using Cloud Deploy, I can deploy in parallel to all of those targets at once, and all of that will be behind this Canary deployment. So let's see what that looks like. So I'm going to apply my configuration. This is the world's saddest GCP cluster because I've been doing this to it repeatedly for several days, so hopefully it doesn't mind. Um, so let's take a look. So now our production target actually has three child targets behind it, which are the US, Europe, and Asia targets, and it's using a canary deployment. So let's see what would happen if I put that same broken change out into production now that I'm using a canary deployment. So I previously built an image that contains that bug, and I'm going to create a new Cloud Deploy release using that image. So here we go. Let's go over and look at Cloud Deploy. Look at our pipeline, and we should see, here's our new release. It's queued, and you can see that the canary rollouts are about to start. Um, so while we wait for that, I'm going to add a little bit more stability. So it would be great if changes didn't even make it out to production at all if they had problems. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a staging environment before the production, production environment. So over here in my cloud deploy configuration, I have another Kubernetes cluster that I made that's going to be our staging cluster, and I'm going to update the delivery pipeline so that before anything makes it out to production, it's going to go to staging. And the last thing I'm going to add is I'm going to add a manual approval step between staging and production. So let's see what that looks like. All right. So over in Cloud Deploy, oh, our Canary rollout started. And you'll see that now we have a staging environment and there's a manual approval step between staging and production. So we'll let that canary keep going. Hopefully it'll finish in time for me to show you, but what will happen is that the canaries will fail and then we can roll back from that to a previous good release. All right, so what have we accomplished? So we've added more stability to our pipeline, to our um, application by adding canary deployment to production. So if something does make it all the way there that has a problem, at least it'll only get out to a small number of users. So that should make our change failure rate lower. And our change failure rate should be even lower because we can actually try things out in staging now before they get there. And if things do make it all the way past the canary, maybe all the way to the canary, we can roll them back really easily because we just have to roll back the canaries, not the whole thing. So our time to restore should be even higher. Okay, so now we've improved the stability. Now we can work on the speed. And it's important to note that we don't want to work on speed first because if things are unstable and we just start moving faster, then you'll just be pushing broken stuff out to production faster, which would actually make everything worse. So we've got a bit more stability. Let's start moving a little bit faster. So it's great that we're going to get a signal from our canaries before problems hit all of our production users, but wouldn't it be nice if changes didn't even make it here at all, and we could actually find a, get the signal that something's broken even earlier. So it turns out that in our project, we actually have some unit tests already, and it turns out that the unit tests would have actually caught that bug that I was showing you earlier, but we're depending on developers to run those unit tests manually. So instead, what we'd really like is we'd like to stop changes from being merged at all if the unit tests 
don't pass. So what we're going to do is we're going to use cloud build to run tests on pull requests so that we can catch these failures before they actually get merged. So here's my cloud build YAML that I created that'll run those tests. And I'm going to go into cloud build. I'm going to add a trigger to run that on each pull request. So I'll run it on a pull request. I'm going to use the repository that I already linked. And I'm gonna check this handy box that will make the results show up as a check in GitHub. So now let's take a look at what would happen if I tried to open a pull request that has that bug in it. So we'll create a new pull request. I'll use a branch that already has that bug. Creating the pull request. And so now, Cloud build should kick in and start running the test. I noticed this was a little bit slow earlier. And one thing that's a little odd is you can see that I could just merge this right now. If you wanted that to not happen, you can just add branch protection uh, to your GitHub repo. And you could make it so that checks like that one from cloud build are required before anything could get merged. So hopefully this is going to kick in and run the tests. If it doesn't, then I can show you the results from a previous run. Okay, let's take a look at results from a previous run. So back over here, we can see this one. This was actually, you know what, I'll show you it in GitHub because that'll be even more exciting. So let's look at one of the ones that failed previously. I think this one. All right, so over here you can see that there are checks that ran. This was my uh, cloud build check. Uh, it shows a summary here. You can see the logs from the cloud build run, and you get a link to cloud build so you can go and dig in and see more. Really? Really not gonna run? Okay, let me just let me just look at the trigger really quickly and see if any pull request enabled. Okay, it's a mystery. All right, so meanwhile, let's let's pretend that those tests actually ran and they failed, which would catch my error. At this point, I can have actually I feel bad not showing you at least anything. Uh, no, okay. Okay, so pretending that those tests failed, we can have more confidence now that the code that's in our repository is in good shape because if something gets merged and makes it in, then we know that at least the tests pass. So with that increased confidence, we can actually go a step further and how about we start automatically rolling things out to our staging environment? Oh, and over here you can see that the Canary, uh, the canary deployment did fail. And so we can cancel that. We're gonna initiate a rollout, roll back to a previous release, which will give our tests even more of a chance to actually run, which would be nice. Okay, so we're rolling back that bad canary that we tried to deploy earlier. No, nothing, nothing. Oh well. Okay, so the other thing that we can do is we can, we're going to add a cloud build trigger that will automatically deploy to our staging environment. So I have a cloud build configuration file here that I made that builds a Docker image, pushes it, it uses artifact registry to generate an SBOM, which I'll be coming back to in a little bit, and then it uses cloud deploy to create a release and then waits for the release to be successful. So I'll add another trigger here. And this, this trigger is going to happen on push to a branch. I'm gonna use this. It's going, so every time that we push to the main branch, which is, which is essentially what happens when a merge occurs. Oh, you know what, I know what I did. Sorry, I know how to fix this. I know how to fix this. Hold on a second, I, I know what I did. Let me, <laughs> I'm just gonna try one more time. Okay, let's try this. I, I, uh, I didn't change the name of the cloud build YAML. <laughs> okay, so on a pull request, this is the one that's gonna work. I'm really, I'm really excited. Uh, okay, haha, -ha, it's not called cloud build YAML, it's called cloud build test. All right, and send the logs to GitHub. Da, 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 da. Now I probably have to close this because I don't want to close it. I'm gonna close it and reopen it. It's gonna be worth it. It's gonna be so fantastic. You'll see the test that you already know is going to fail, fail. <laughs> Create pull request. Create pull request. Magic. Run the test. Come on, you can do it. Run the test, run the test. Okay, well, anyways. 
Okay, so let's create the trigger that will uh, do our deployment to staging. All right, so push to a branch, and, and it's a cloud build deploy. All right, nope, repository, second generation repository, that one. Uh -huh. Okay, so it would be really nice if that one ran too, but oh well. So I'm not going to merge that because it is broken. Um, but let's say that we caught the bug and I go back over here and I want to fix my bug. So I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna fix the bug because we just had a little inversion in the logic that we meant to have there. All right, so over here, my change is pushed, the test should run again, no tests are running. Oh well, merge, merge with no confidence, but let's pretend that that worked. Okay, so now that that's merged, what'll happen is cloud build will kick in again, should kick in this time, and it will create a rollout to staging, and then once that's there, we basically, at this point, we've increased our speed because we are getting, we're getting more signals on our pull requests about what the state is and because we're deploying straight to staging. So that means it's basically, at this point, just a business decision about whether you want to go all the way to something like continuous deployment, where instead of a manual approval check in the middle, you could be maybe running some automation against staging and then deploying right to production. The other thing that we can do is we can actually push things even further left you might have noticed that I've been doing my editing in cloud workstations. So cloud workstations comes with Minikube. And since we're using cloud deploy, cloud deploy uses scaffold and scaffold lets you do local development loops really easily. So what I can do is I can start running uh, scaffold dev. And what this does is it uses the same scaffold configuration file that Cloud Deploy is using to deploy, deploy to production. It's building my image and then it's running it locally inside Cloud Workstations using Minikube. I just can't believe that those tests didn't run. Well, we're waiting for that. See if there's anything. Oh, it, it, well, at least it did, the, <laughs> it did the deployment, but not the tests. Well, that is just a mystery what happened there. So anyways, uh, the merge that I did has triggered the um, cloud build YAML that has a deployment, which is doing a build and push, and then it's generating an SBOM, and then it's going to create, once that's completed, it'll create a, a new rollout to staging over here. All right, so meanwhile, back here, we're waiting for our local deployment to stabilize. So one other cool thing about Cloud Workstations is it does automatic port forwarding for you. So the URL that I'm going to here, you might not be able to see because it's very small, um, it has port 80 in it. So I'm hitting port 80 on my workstation in order to do this, but my uh, using Minikube and Scaffold, my application is running on port 8080. So all I have to do is change the URL to 8080 and I can actually hit the version of my application that's running in cloud workstations using Minikube and Scaffold. And it will do hot reloading as well. So if I start making changes to this, it'll get rebuilt automatically and redeployed. So I can actually push things all the way left to my local development environment and see the changes as I make them. Okay, so we've increased the stability, we've increased the speed. The last thing I wanna to talk to you about is increasing the security posture of the project. So let's take a look at some of these things that we've deployed uh, to Cloud Deploy. So we can actually go and look at the artifacts that we deployed and both, uh, both Cloud Deploy and Cloud Build have this feature where, oh, that's not the one I wanna show you though because that one, doesn't, that one wasn't built with. I want to show you the security insights. Oh, that's not a good one. Sorry. Let me go over to Cloud Build again. And I want to show you the security insights panel for some of these. So that one should have one. And if it doesn't, I will be sad. Build artifacts, uh -huh. security insights. All right, okay, so here is an artifact that we built 
using Cloud Build. And using the Security Insights panel, we can see that the artifact meets the requirements for Salsa Build Level 2. We can see that there was one vulnerability that was found inside the image. We can also see the VEX statements that were generated and stored in Artifact Registry. And you might remember I was showing a step that generates an SBOM using Artifact Registry, so this is the result of that. And then finally, because we were using Cloud Build, we generated Salsa 1.0 provenance, which you can see here, that's also stored in Artifact Registry. And this has all the information about exactly what went into building this artifact. So what you can do with this is using a combination of the VEX statements and the SBOMs, you can use those to answer questions like, this new vulnerability that came out, is it affecting any of my images that are running in production? And using provenance, you can create policies around the things that you deploy to production. For example, in my Kubernetes clusters, I'm using this bin -off Z policy, and it's using a new feature called a salsa check, which is so new that you can only use it in audit mode right now, so it produces logs when images fail the check. It doesn't actually stop them from being deployed, at least not yet. But what this does is it requires that anything that's deployed to production was built with Cloud Build and that it uses build as code. So that'll ensure that anything that's making it into production is actually using all of this automation that we set up. So, I guess the test didn't just decide to run at the end there. So ignoring that particular issue, this is how you can improve the speed, stability, and the security posture of your applications using Cloud Build, Cloud Deploy, Artifact Registry, Cloud Workstations, and binary authorization. So if you're interested in doing any of that, the repository that I was using is public, and it has all of the configuration that I was using there. And in the meantime, I'd like to welcome Mark to the stage from ThoughtWorks, who's going to be talking about some examples from industry of DevOps that show what this actually looks like in real life. Thank you, Chrissy. And may I just note, it was a wonderful demo. If you don't have demo issues, it means the demo force is not with you today, having done this many times myself. So I want to thank both Nate and Christy for introducing DORA and the concepts of DORA. Very, very important subject. And also for a wonderful demo. And I must say that <coughs> Where am I? Okay, there we are. And so I, first of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Mark Richter. Um, I'm the head of practice at ThoughtWorks for Google Cloud in North America. I've been at ThoughtWorks for about a dozen years. I've been using Google Cloud for about eight of those years. And I'm, I've been using a Google Cloud workstation for all of my development since last November. <laughs> Which leads me to say that, I don't know where you are, but from where I am, Google Cloud is the only cloud you need. Um, and as some of you may know, uh, to introduce going forward here with some results, ThoughtWorks indeed pioneered um, continuous integration and continuous delivery about eight years ago, and it was first published by Jez Humble in his seminal book, Continuous Delivery, in 2011. And what I want to, what I want to go into is taking that, those concepts and DORA and talking to you about what this means in terms of delivering actual business value from doing continuous integration and continuous delivery. Because at the end of the day, why do, you, why do we do this stuff? We do this to derive business value for our companies from these techniques, right? So that we're more profitable and we keep people employed. So let me talk first about a huge global electronic component manufacturing firm. Um, this firm, client of ours, 100 microservices and they brought us in, we used domain-driven design to strangulate a legacy of COTS application software into a microservice architecture. 
building it and deploying it using CI and CD. And you can see the impressive results here. Impressive results like this mean that the rapid release of new features to production is now business as usual for this company. So, and, and, and let me emphasize that. Getting to the point where you're releasing multiple times a week, potentially multiple times a day, you're committing code to production, you have multiple times a day, you have high confidence that you're not breaking things. Why? Because you're running tons of automated tests against it. All part of the process. And then you're measuring, you're measuring using the four key metrics. So this is a very, very notable automobile manufacturer. And here we help them with 50 microservices reaching across all aspects of the business, sales, after sales, parts, marketing, e-commerce, and CRM. Now they see less than a week lead time to change. They can deploy tested reliable code to production every day. The mean time to recover from failure is under an hour. Now 20 years ago, working for another company and doing an e-commerce product, I would have given my left leg for an MTTR under it. So this is a really big deal. And it's not rocket science. None of it is. It's all achieved through discipline and automation. Lots and lots of automation. This bank asked us to help them with the reliability of their release process. And so we introduced radically more automated testing and achieved continuous delivery, which again, is business as usual for them now. So finally, this telecommunications firm brought us, they brought us in to help them with comprehensive agile modernization. And they now have the capability to do over 250 releases a year compared to just five releases a year in the old days. Think about that. Think, think about the business value in being able to reliably push 250 releases into production a year compared to five with high confidence. So that's, that's my little presentation of some really, I mean, these are real world examples of things that we have done for our clients. Um, if you'd like to talk to us more about this, you can visit ThoughtWorks in booth 1709 down in the exhibit hall. And to wrap things up, I will hand off to Shlomo, who's going to talk about DevOps on the ground. Okay, so I generally say very bold statements, and bear with me because you're gonna judge me, but don't do it until I finish. So forget deployment frequency, uh, forget velocity, forget lead time, forget automation. And I'm gonna prove to you why every statement I just said is true. DevOps at the score is not what I'm gonna share today. It's DevOps that everybody should be doing and the way, the way, the way they should be doing it. So if I'm not gonna focus on the metrics of Dora right now, we'll get to how you complement Dora. But Dora can actually hide huge epic failures. Metrics can hurt a lot of people. The reason being is businesses have responses to pressures to show good metrics versus actually correcting the problem itself. So let's start with principles. If I need DevOps velocity, or let's call it happiness, which is really what we're after, it's not speed, it's happiness, and DevOps is the ability to collaborate with others that are part of a whole for delivery, you need C alignment. So we have three principles, and each principle actually results in DevOps functioning at elite practice. So the CHRO is concerned with people leaving companies, people feeling unhealthy, people having mental health issues, which is a real thing for frontline people, people who do deployments and worry about the company, how it's gonna resolve issues. The value has to be delivered in a way that it's separate from you enjoying your life. 
Simple principle, but will support orchestration, not automation. Automation is ma ma maintained by people who are SMEs. Orchestration links automation together, which releases that person from having to be there. CIO principle. You may not ch uh, change existing services or machines. This promotes CI/CD. This promotes deployment strategies. This promotes immutable environments. This just promotes not keeping changes that we consider to be, oh, I wasn't expecting that to happen. The reason it happened is you have drift. You have a lot of environments that you don't know what they are. You don't know the state of them. So don't change them. Make new ones. The third one is nobody has access to shared environments. Again, this is beyond zero trust. It's absent trust. Remove access you don't require entirely and have CI, CD, and Gitflow, GitOps actually build and deploy so you don't need to go into environments. So this helps advance observability to full stack observability, having telemetry and metrics that you require. Again, DevOps principles for happiness. All of these try to make sure that you are not the hero that takes a toll when bad shit happens. You are not the hero when something needs to be deployed. You are not the hero that has to make demos work, which you can't. N not specific here, it's every demo. <laughs> every demo. So I'm going to actually go into the math. And I'll, uh, there's some stuff that's not shared here. So how does organizations actually fix and present these metrics? You can add people. There's a downside to adding people. A large downside because you distribute the work across a lot of people and you lose your SMEs. We're not looking at that in Dora metrics. You could remove steps. That's every digital team at every company. They just say, well, I have no regulations. I can just do it without all these steps and go straight to production. Wickedly fast, really shitty quality, really bad confidence, right? Because you're just skipping things. You're missing things. The last one is essentially resilience and orchestration, right? You're going to improve efficiency, which is really what you should be targeting. Not automation, because automation, again, is maintained by SMEs. It ruins your life. You have to be around. Who here hasn't had to work on Ansible errors, exit codes, right? You have to manage it. Put it into orchestration so your, your, your tests always operate in a consistent fashion because they're run in a consistent fashion. So why is? time to market and release frequency irrelevant. They're just pressures. I could make it up. I could do weekly. I could do daily. What's good? Ruining lives? Probably not. So how are you getting your metrics? So essentially, what you should be targeting is efficiency uh, based on the human effort required to release. Forget runtime. Again, if I have lead time and I want to release, but I have to do old appropriate testing to prevent outages, let it run. Who is it affecting? Nobody. The software goes out when it needs to with the appropriate controls, testing that's orchestrated. So again, lead time, time to market, release frequency, all bullshit. You don't need those metrics. You need to know how is it hurting people, how are the teams working together? Which business process isn't included? And make sure the orchestration does that for you. So th this is the how. So that's how you measure it. Dora does measure pain, but you can hide pain by hi hiring people. You can hide pain by skipping steps. And then you get your deployment frequency. It looks great on paper, but ruins lives. But what does, what does good look like if I'm doing the mathematics? Because you, you can actually make it into equation for everything. Innovation potential is basically a function of spare time. So let's say you assign a certain amount of engineers. Every engineer has something like 20% of their time related to the application, which is reasonable. They get familiar with the app, their SMEs. But you also need spare time to innovate. What's too much? So like you have to balance this. It's, it's kind of like an equilibrium. You need to find a place where someone's engaged enough but still has spare time to innovate. And it's complicated. That's what Dora should be focusing on so that you reduce heroics, but you also don't destroy your SMEs. It, it's, it's, again, a balance. Again, resilience is a function of the efficiency of the whole process, be it QA testing, be it dev testing, deployments, all of that stuff. How efficient is each of those processes? I guarantee in this entire room, QA is most likely the most inefficient, and that's why we can't get out very quickly. Again, because there hasn't been much investment on QA automation as of yet. Uh, which gets orchestrated. I don't want to step in that one. Um, 
again, sustainability is a function of idle time. How many people here, and I'll ask a question, how many people here run a non-prod environment that runs all the time? You never destroy it or turn it off. So we're killing the planet, right? So the context I always go with an analogy. You, you, if, you, if you lease a car or you rent a car, if you're not using it, what did you return the rental? You're paying for it. In this case, the environment pays for it, water, heating, cooling, all of that. But we leave environment sitting. If you go back to the principles where you, 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 you don't change an existing machine, then why would I leave a machine running? I have the ability to create it and destroy it. It's, it's all linked together. And its intent is to prevent idle time. Again, those idle systems become hard for us to manage. Again, ruining lives. But again, if we go back to Dora, I mean, take metrics that go, I release daily, frequently, hourly, whatever it is. What does it mean to the people behind it? Do we actually measure the impact to the individuals that bear this burden as we increase the frequency? Do we have the resilience to manage the business pressure? So epic failures can occur with fantastic DORA metrics unless we measure the impact on the human, which is each of us. I'll stop there. I don't want to take too much. Any, I can keep going? So I'll go back here and try to go into the capabilities that you achieve. Uh, for one, <clears throat> most organizations, without these principles, you don't have alignment from leaders. So DevOps only occurs when all the business processes, people, technology, and experience I don't know why we still use people, process, like techno technology. Experience is where the happiness occurs. Experience is what you're actually after. This is to make sure the experience across the entire IT organization occurs. You, you have the metrics you require to be informed of your environment and your applications. You do not persist environments just because it's convenient to leave it. It's actually not convenient to leave it. It has huge tolls on people, maybe not yourself, but on other, other members of the organization. And then generally, org organizations think buying tools fix things because they bought automation. And they're like, it's 40% automated. But the reality is you should be focusing on what, what are people doing? When are they spending their time? Slack productivity says, how many messages do you send? I want to know how many messages are at night. I want to know how many messages are on weekends. Do they present that data? No, they just, whoever can get the highest number of uh, messages is the best. So the, the context here is if you go by principle versus metrics, the metrics will result from maintaining your principles, which is what we should all be doing. Uh, this is the piece that's missing. It's not about showing metrics that look good. It's about making sure the people who work with you are happy and enjoying their work. And hopefully you drive down attrition and you don't lose or ruin anybody's lives. Maintain DevOps happiness, not velocity. Thanks. All right. Thank you, everyone. One more thing. I can't really talk about it, but please keep looking out this week. Uh, there may be something more that happens. <laughs> With that, uh, here's some other sessions to check out. They're all good. They're great. Um, one of them might even have me in it again. And um, yeah, that's it. Go to lunch. <laughs>